Chapter 14 Joseph and His Brethren Joseph listened to his father's instructions and feared the Lord. He was more obedient to his father's righteous teachings than any of his brethren. He treasured his instructions, and with integrity of heart loved to obey God. He was grieved at the wrong conduct of some of his brethren, and meekly entreated them to pursue a righteous course and leave off their wicked acts. This only embittered them against him. His hatred of sin was such that he could not endure to see his brethren sinning against God. He laid the matter before his father, hoping that his authority might reform them. This exposure of their wrongs enraged his brethren against him. They had observed their father's strong love for Joseph and were envious at him. Their envy grew into hatred and finally to murder. The angel of God instructed Joseph in dreams, which he innocently related to his brethren. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it to his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him, and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. Jacob appeared to regard the dreams of his son with indifference, but he had been often instructed by the Lord in dreams himself, and he believed that the Lord was teaching Joseph in the same manner. He reproved Joseph that his true feelings might not be discovered by his envious brothers. Jacob's sons were shepherds and fed their flocks where they could find the best pastures. In traveling from place to place with their cattle, they often wandered a great distance from their father's house, so that they did not see their father for several months at a time. In his anxiety for them, he sent Joseph to see if they were all well. With the true interest of a brother, Joseph searched for his brethren, where his father supposed he would find them, but they were not there. A certain man found him wandering in the field in search of his brethren, and directed him to Dothan. This was a long journey for Joseph, but he cheerfully performed it, because he loved his brethren, and also wished to relieve the anxiety of his father. But he was illy repaid for his love to them, and obedience to his father. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him, and cast him into some pit. And we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands, and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands, to deliver him to his father again. Joseph, unsuspicious of what was to befall him, approached his brethren with gladness of heart to greet them after his long, wearisome journey. His brothers rudely repulsed him. He told them his errand, but they answered him not. Joseph was alarmed at their angry looks. Fear took the place of joy, and he instinctively shrank with dread from their presence. Then they took hold of him violently, they taunted him with admonitions he had given them in the past, and accused him of relating his dreams to exalt himself above them in the mind of their father, that he might love him more than themselves. They accused him of hypocrisy. As they gave utterance to their envious feelings, Satan controlled their minds, and they had no sense of pity and no feelings of love for their brother. They stripped him of his coat of many colors that he wore, which was a token of his father's love, and which had excited their envious feelings. Joseph was weary and hungry, yet they gave him neither rest nor food. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, there was no water in it. As Judah thought of Joseph lying in the pit, suffering a lingering death by starvation, he was troubled. For a short time he, with the others of his brethren, seemed to possess a satanic frenzy. 
But after they had begun to accomplish their wicked purposes to the helpless, innocent Joseph, some of them were ill at ease. They did not feel that satisfaction they thought they should have to see Joseph perish. Judah was the first to express his feelings. He said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit, and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for twenty pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. The thought of being sold as a slave was more dreadful to Joseph than to die. He manifested the deepest anguish, and appealed first to one of his brethren, then to another, for compassion. Some of their hearts were moved with pity, but through fear of derision from the rest, kept silent. They all thought they had gone too far to repent of their acts. For Joseph might expose them to their father, and he would be exceedingly angry with them for their treatment of his much-loved Joseph. They steeled their hearts against his distress, and would not listen to his entreaties for his father's sake to let him go, but sold him as a slave. Reuben went away from his brethren, that they might not learn his purpose in regard to Joseph. He advised them to put him in the pit, and designed to return and take him to his father. And Reuben returned unto the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit. And he rent his clothes, and he returned unto his brethren, and said, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? His brethren told him that they had sold Joseph. And they took Joseph's coat, and killed a kid of the goats, and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father, and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. They caused their father intense anguish, as he pictured to himself the violent death his son must have suffered by being torn in pieces by wild beasts. His sons had not imagined that their father's grief would be so deep. All his children tried to comfort him, but he refused to refrain from his grief. He declared to his children that he would go down into his grave mourning. Joseph's brethren flattered themselves that they were taking a sure course to prevent the fulfillment of Joseph's strange dreams. But the Lord controlled events and caused the cruel course of Joseph's brethren to bring about the fulfillment of the dreams which they were laboring to frustrate. Joseph was greatly afflicted to be separated from his father, and his bitterest sorrow was in reflecting upon his father's grief. But God did not leave Joseph to go into Egypt alone. Angels prepared the way for his reception. Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, bought him of the Ishmaelites. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered him, and gave him favor with his master, so that all he possessed he entrusted to Joseph's care. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had save the bread which he did eat. It was considered an abomination for a Hebrew to prepare food for an Egyptian. When Joseph was tempted to deviate from the path of right, to transgress the law of God, and prove untrue to his master, he firmly resisted, and gave evidence of the elevating power of the fear of God in his answer to his master's wife. After speaking of the great confidence of his master in him, by entrusting all that he had with him, he exclaims, How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He would not be persuaded to deviate from the path of righteousness and trample upon God's law by any inducements or threats. And when he was accused, and a base crime was falsely laid to his charge, he did not sink in despair. In the consciousness of innocence and right, he still trusted in God. And God, who had hitherto supported him, did not forsake him. He was bound with fetters and kept in a gloomy prison. Yet God turned even this misfortune into a blessing. He gave him favor with the keeper of the prison, and to Joseph was soon committed the charge of all the prisoners. Here is an example to all generations who should live upon the earth. Although they may be exposed to temptations, yet they should ever realize that there is a defense at hand, and it will be their own fault if they are not preserved. God will be a present help and a spirit a shield. Although surrounded with the severest temptations, there is a source of strength to which they can apply and resist them. 
How fierce was the assault upon Joseph's morals? It came from one of influence, the most likely to lead astray. Yet how promptly and firmly was it resisted? He suffered for his virtue and integrity, for she who would lead him astray revenged herself upon the virtue she could not subvert, and by her influence caused him to be cast into prison by charging him with a foul wrong. Here Joseph suffered, because he would not yield his integrity. He had placed his reputation and interest in the hands of God, and although he was suffered to be afflicted for a time to prepare him to fill an important position, yet God safely guarded that reputation that was blackened by a wicked accuser, and afterward, in his own good time, caused it to shine. God made even the prison the way to his elevation. Virtue will in time bring its own reward. The shield which covered Joseph's heart was the fear of God, which caused him to be faithful and just to his master and true to God. He despised that ingratitude which would lead him to abuse his master's confidence, although his master might never learn the fact. The grace of God he called to his aid, and then fought with the tempter. He nobly says, How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He came off conqueror. Amid the snares to which all are exposed, they need strong and trustworthy defenses on which to rely. Many in this corrupt age have so small a supply of the grace of God that in many instances their defense is broken down by the first assault, and fierce temptations take them captives. The shield of grace can preserve all unconquered by the temptations of the enemy, though surrounded with the most corrupting influences. By firm principle and unwavering trust in God, their virtue and nobleness of character can shine, and although surrounded with evil, no taint need be left upon their virtue and integrity. And if, like Joseph, they suffer calumny and false accusations, providence will overrule all the enemy's devices for good, and God will, in his own time, exalt as much higher as for a while they were debased by wicked revenge. The part which Joseph acted in connection with the scenes of the gloomy prison was that which raised him finally to prosperity and honor. God designed that he should obtain an experience by temptations, adversity, and hardships to prepare him to fill an exalted position. While he was confined in prison, Pharaoh became offended with two of his officers, the chief baker and the chief butler, and they were put in the prison where Joseph was bound and the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them. And they continued a season in ward. Joseph made his life useful even while in prison. His exemplary conduct, humble deportment, and faithfulness obtained for him the confidence of all in the prison, and those who were connected with it. He did not spend his time in mourning over the injustice of his accusers, which had deprived him of his liberty. One morning, as Joseph brought food to the king's officers, he observed that they were looking very sad. He kindly inquired, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. Then the butler related to Joseph his dream, which he interpreted that the butler would be restored to the king's favor and deliver Pharaoh's cup unto his hand, as he had formerly done. The butler was satisfied with the interpretation, and his mind was at once relieved. Joseph told the chief butler that in three days he would be no more a prisoner. He felt very grateful to Joseph, because of the interest he had manifested for him, and the kind treatment he had received at his hands, and above all, for helping him when in great distress of mind by interpreting his dream. Then Joseph, in a very touching manner, alluded to his captivity, and entreated him, But think on me when it shall be well with thee, and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh. And bring me out of this house, for indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also have I done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he took courage and made known his dream. As soon as he related his dream, Joseph looked sad. He understood its terrible meaning. Joseph possessed a kind, sympathizing heart, yet his high sense of duty led him to give the truthful, 
yet sad interpretation to the chief baker's dream. He told them that the three baskets upon his head meant three days, and that, as in his dream, the birds ate the baked meats out of the upper basket, so they would eat his flesh as he hung upon a tree. And it came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again, and he gave the cup unto Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. The butler was guilty of the sin of ingratitude. After he had obtained relief from his anxiety by the cheering interpretation of Joseph, he thought that he should, if brought again into the king's favor, certainly remember the captive Joseph and speak in his favor to the king. He had seen the interpretation of the dream exactly fulfilled, yet in his prosperity he forgot Joseph in his affliction and confinement. Ingratitude is regarded by the Lord as among the most aggravating of sins. And although abhorred by God and man, yet it is of daily occurrence. Two years longer Joseph remained in his gloomy prison. The Lord gave Pharaoh remarkable dreams. In the morning the king was troubled, because he could not understand them. He called for the magicians of Egypt and the wise men. The king thought that they would soon help him to understand these dreams, for they had a reputation for solving difficulties. The king related his dreams to them, but was greatly disappointed to find that with all their magic and boasted wisdom, they could not explain them. The perplexity and distress of the king increased. As the chief butler saw his distress, all at once Joseph came into his mind, and at the same time a conviction of his forgetfulness and ingratitude. Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. He then related to the king the dreams which he and the chief baker had, which troubled them as the dreams which now troubled the king, and said, And there was there with us a young man, an Hebrew, servant to the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. To each man according to his dream he did interpret. And it came to pass, as he interpreted to us, so it was. Me he restored unto mine office, and him he hanged. It was humiliating to Pharaoh to turn away from the magicians and wise men of his kingdom to a Hebrew servant. But his learned and wise men failed him, and he now will condescend to accept the humble services of a slave if his troubled mind can obtain relief. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon. And he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee, that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Joseph's answer to the king shows his strong faith and humble trust in God. He modestly disclaims all honor of possessing in himself superior wisdom to interpret. He tells the king that his knowledge is not greater than that of those whom he has consulted. It is not in me. God alone can explain these mysteries. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, In my dream, behold, I stood upon the bank of the river, and behold, there came up out of the river seven kind, fat-fleshed and well-flavored. And they fed in a meadow, and behold, seven other kind came up after them, poor and very ill-favored, and lean-fleshed, such as I never saw in all the land of Egypt for badness. And the lean and the ill-favored kind did eat up the first seven fat kind, and when they had eaten them up, it could not be known that they had eaten them. But they were still ill-favored as at the beginning. So I awoke. And I saw in my dream, and behold, seven ears came up in one stalk, full and good. And behold, seven ears, withered, thin, and blasted with the east wind, sprung up after them. And the thin ears devoured the seven good ears. And I told this unto the magicians, but there was none that could declare it to me. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. God hath shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good kind are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. And the seven thin and ill-favored kind that come up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. Joseph told the king that there would be seven years of great plenty, 
everything would grow in great abundance. Fields and gardens would yield more plentifully than formerly. Fruits and grains would yield abundantly. And these seven years of abundance were to be followed by seven years of famine. The years of plenty would be given that he might prepare for the coming years of famine. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice, it is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise, and set him over the land of Egypt. The king believed all that Joseph said. He believed that God was with him, and was impressed with the fact that he was the most suitable man to be placed in authority at the head of affairs. He did not despise him because he was a Hebrew slave. He saw that he possessed an excellent spirit. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Forasmuch as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. Although Joseph was exalted as ruler over all the land, yet he did not forget God. He knew that he was a stranger in a strange land, separated from his father and his brethren, which often caused him sadness. But he firmly believed that God's hand had overruled his course to place him in an important position. And depending on God continually, he performed all the duties of his office as ruler over the land of Egypt with faithfulness. And in the seven plenteous years the earth brought forth by handfuls. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up the food in the cities. The food of the field which was around about every city laid he up in the same. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea very much, until he left numbering, for it was without number. Joseph traveled throughout all the land of Egypt, giving command to build immense storehouses, and using his clear head and excellent judgment to aid in the preparations to secure food necessary for the long years of famine. At length, the seven years of plenteousness in the land of Egypt ended, and the seven years of dearth began to come, according as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he saith to you, do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses, and sold unto the Egyptians, and the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. The famine was severe in the land of Canaan. Jacob and his sons were troubled. Their supply of food was nearly exhausted, and they looked forward to the future with perplexity. They talked despondingly to one another in regard to being able to supply their families with food. Want and starvation stared them in the face. At length, Jacob heard of the wonderful provisions which the king of Egypt had made, that he was instructed of God in a dream seven years before the famine to lay up large supplies for the seven years of famine which were to follow, and that all the countries journeyed to Egypt to buy corn. He said unto his sons, why do ye look one upon another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Get you down thither, and buy for us from thence, that we may live and not die. And Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob sent not with his brethren, for he said, Lest peradventure mischief befall him. Jacob's sons came with the crowd of buyers to purchase corn of Joseph and they bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. And Joseph knew his brethren, but he appeared not to know them, and spake roughly unto them. And he said unto them, Whence came you? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them, and said unto them, Ye are spies, to see the nakedness of the land ye are come. They assured Joseph that their only errand into Egypt was to buy food. Joseph again charges them with being spies. He wished to learn that they possessed the same haughty spirit they had had when he was with them. And he was anxious to draw from them some information in regard to his father and Benjamin. They feel humbled in their adversity and manifest grief 
rather than anger at the suspicions of Joseph. They assure him that they are no spies, but the sons of one man, that they are twelve brethren, that the youngest is now with their father, and one is not. His father and Benjamin are the very ones Joseph wishes to learn in regard to. He professes to doubt the truthfulness of their story, and tells them that he will prove them, and that they shall not go forth from Egypt until their youngest brother come hither. He proposes to keep them in confinement until one shall go and bring their brother to prove their words, whether there is any truth in them. If they would not consent to this, he would regard them as spies. The sons of Jacob felt unwilling to consent to this arrangement. It would require some time for one to go to their father to get Benjamin and their families would suffer for food. And then again, who among them would undertake the journey alone, leaving their brethren in a prison? How could that one meet his father? They saw his distress at the supposed death of Joseph, and he would feel that he was deprived of all his sons. As they conversed with one another in this manner, Joseph heard them. They said further, It may be we shall lose our lives or be made slaves. And if one go back to our father for Benjamin and bring him here, he may be made a slave also, and our father will surely die. They decided to all remain and suffer together rather than to bring greater sorrow upon their father by the loss of his much-loved Benjamin. The three days of confinement were days of bitter sorrow with Jacob's sons. They reflected upon their past wrong course, especially their cruelty to Joseph. They knew if they were convicted of being spies, and they could not bring evidence to clear themselves, they would all have to die or become slaves. They doubted whether any effort any one of them might make would cause their father to consent to have Benjamin go from him, after the cruel death, as he thought, Joseph had suffered. They sold Joseph as a slave, and they were fearful that God designed to punish them by suffering them to become slaves. Joseph considers that his father and the families of his brethren may be suffering for food, and he is convinced that his brethren have repented of their cruel treatment of him, and that they would in no case treat Benjamin as they had treated him. Joseph makes another proposition to his brethren. And he said unto them the third day, This do and live, for I fear God. If ye be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye, carry corn for the famine of your houses, but bring your youngest brother unto me, so shall your words be verified, and ye shall not die. They agreed to accept this proposition of Joseph's, but expressed to one another little hope that their father will let Benjamin return with them. They accused themselves and one another in regard to their treatment of Joseph. And they said one to another, We are verily guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child? And ye would not hear. Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. And they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter. And he turned himself about from them and wept, and returned to them again and communed with them, and took from them Simeon, and bound him before their eyes. Joseph selected Simeon to be bound, because he was the instigator and principal actor in the cruelty of his brethren toward him. He then directed that his brethren should be liberally supplied with provision, and that every man's money should be placed in his sack. They pursued their homeward journey in sadness. As one of them opened his sack to feed his beast with provender, he found his money, just as he had brought it to Joseph. He told his brethren, and they considered that a new evil would arise. And they were afraid, and said one to another, What is this that God hath done unto us? Shall we consider this as a token of good from the Lord? Or has he suffered it to occur to punish us for our sins and plunge us still deeper in affliction? They acknowledged that God had seen their sins and has marked their wrongs and that he is now visiting them for their transgressions. When they came to their father Jacob, they related to him all that had transpired and said, The man who is the Lord of the land spake roughly to us and took us for spies of the country. And we said unto him, We are true men, we are no spies. We be twelve brethren, sons of our father. One is not, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. 
They told their father that he would not believe their word, and said, If ye are not spies, leave one of your brethren with me, and take food for your households. And when ye come again, bring your youngest brother, and then I will release you, your brother that is bound. And ye shall be at liberty to trade in the land. As they emptied their sacks, every man's money was found in his sack, and they were all afraid. Jacob was distressed, and said unto them, Me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and ye will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. Reuben assured his father that if he would entrust Benjamin to his care, he would surely bring him again to his father. If not, he might slay his two sons. This rash speech did not relieve the mind of Jacob. He said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If mischief befall him by the way in which ye go, then shall ye bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Jacob's affections cling to Benjamin with all the strength of a mother's love. He shows how deeply he has felt the loss of Joseph. But want presses upon Jacob and his children, and their households are calling for food. Jacob requests his sons to go again into Egypt and buy food. Judah says to his father that he cannot go down unless Benjamin is with them. For the man did solemnly protest unto us, saying, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. Judah assures his father that he will be surety for his brother, that if he would send him with them, they would go. And if he did not bring Benjamin back, he would bear the blame of it forever. He tells his father that while they had been lingering, because of his unwillingness to send Benjamin, they could have journeyed to Egypt and returned again. Jacob feels compelled to permit his son Benjamin to go with his brethren. He also sent a present to the ruler, hoping therewith to obtain his favor. He also directed his sons to take double money and return the money found in their sacks, for it might have been placed there by mistake. He says to them, Take also your brother, and arise, go again unto the man. As his sons were about to leave him to go on their doubtful journey, their aged father arose, and while standing in their midst, raised his hands to heaven, and entreated the Lord to go with them, and pronounced upon them a gracious benediction. And God Almighty give you mercy before the man, that he may send away your other brother and Benjamin. If I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. And the men took that present, and they took double money in their hand, and Benjamin, and rose up and went down to Egypt, and stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he could scarcely restrain his brotherly feelings of love. He gave direction to make preparation for his brethren to dine with him. When they were taken into Joseph's house, they were afraid that it was for the purpose of calling them to account because of the money found in their sacks. And they thought that it might have been intentionally placed there for the purpose of finding occasion against them to make them slaves, and that they were brought into the ruler's house to better accomplish this object. They sought to make friends with the steward of the house, and made known to him that they had found their money in the mouths of their sacks, fearing that the ruler who had treated them so roughly would accuse them of wrong in regard to the matter. They informed the steward that they had brought back the money found in their sacks in full weight, also other money to buy food, and added, We cannot tell who put our money in our sacks. And he said, Peace be to you, fear not. Your God and the God of your father hath given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money, and he brought Simeon out unto them. The words of the steward relieved their anxiety, and they thought God was indeed gracious unto them, as their father had entreated he would be. When Joseph came home, his brethren gave him the present in the name of their father, and they bowed themselves to him to the earth. And he asked them of their welfare, and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom ye spake? Is he yet alive? And they answered, Thy servant, our father, is in good health. He is yet alive. And they bowed down their heads and made obeisance. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother, of whom ye spake unto me? And he said, God be gracious unto thee, my son. And Joseph made haste, for his bowels did yearn upon his brother. And he sought there to weep, and he entered into his chamber and wept there. And he washed his face and went out, and refrained himself, and said, Set on bread. Joseph did not eat at the same table with his brethren, 
for the Egyptians considered it an abomination for them to eat bread with the Hebrews. Joseph placed his brethren at the table, as was customary when their ages were known, commencing with the eldest, according to his birthright, arranging them in order down to the youngest, as though he perfectly knew their ages. His brethren were astonished at this act of Joseph, who they thought could have no knowledge of their ages. As he sent a portion of food to each of his brethren, he sent Benjamin five times as much as the others. He did this not only to show his particular regard for his brother Benjamin, but to prove them, to see if they regarded Benjamin with the same envious feelings they had him. They thought that Joseph did not understand their language and were free to converse with one another in his presence. Therefore Joseph had a good opportunity to learn the true state of their feelings without their knowledge. Joseph again commanded to provide his brethren with food, as much as they could carry, and to put every man's money in his sack's mouth, and to place his silver cup in the sack of the youngest. When his brethren were gone out of the city, Joseph sent his steward to overtake them, and inquire why they had rewarded evil for good, by taking the silver cup belonging to the king, whereby indeed he divineth. Kings and rulers had a cup from which they drank, which was considered a sure detective if any poisonous substance was placed in their drink. And they said unto him, Wherefore saith my lord these words, God forbid that thy servants should do according to this thing. Behold, the money which we found in our sacks' mouths we brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of thy lord's house silver or gold? With whomsoever of thy servants it be found, both let him die, and we also will be my lord's bondmen. And he said, Now also let it be according unto the, your words. He with whom it is found shall be my servant, and ye shall be blameless. Then they speedily took down every man his sack to the ground, and opened every man his sack, and he searched and began at the eldest, and left at the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. At this discovery all were greatly surprised, and to express their great distress, they rent their garments, which was the custom when in great affliction. Benjamin was more amazed and confounded than his brethren. They returned into the city sorrowful and afraid. They thought that the hand of God was against them for their past wickedness. By their own promise, Benjamin was appointed to a life of slavery, and the fears of their father they thought would be fully realized. Mischief had befallen his much-loved Benjamin. Judah had pledged himself to be surety for Benjamin. And Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, for he was yet there, and they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said unto them, What deed is this that ye have done? Wot ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine? Joseph asked this question to draw forth from his brethren an acknowledgment of their past wrong course, that their true feelings might be more fully revealed. He did not claim any power of divination, but was willing his brethren should believe that he could read the secret acts of their lives. And Judah said, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. Judah told his brethren that God had found out their iniquity for selling their brother in Egypt, and was now returning upon them their transgressions by permitting them to become slaves also. Joseph refused to accept them all, according to the word of Judah, as bondmen. And he said, God forbid that I should do so, but the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. Judah spoke with Joseph aside from the rest, and related to him the reluctance of his father to let Benjamin come with them to Egypt, and that he pledged himself to become surety for Benjamin, that if he brought him not to his father, he would bear the blame forever. He eloquently pleaded in behalf of his father, relating his great grief at the loss of Joseph, and that Benjamin was all that was left of the mother which his father loved, and that if Benjamin should be separated from his father, he would die, for his life was bound up in the lad's life. Judah then nobly offered to become a slave instead of his brother, for he could not meet his father without Benjamin was with him. Said Judah, Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad a bondman to my lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. Joseph was satisfied. He had proved his brethren, 
and had seen in them the fruits of true repentance for their sins. And he was so deeply affected that he could no longer conceal his feelings and requested to be left alone with his brethren. He then gave vent to his long-suppressed feelings and wept aloud. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. His brethren could not answer him for astonishment. They could not really believe that the ruler of Egypt was their brother Joseph, whom they had envied and would have murdered, but finally were satisfied to sell as a slave. All their ill treatment of their brother painfully passed before them, and especially his dreams, which they had despised and had labored to prevent their fulfillment. They had acted their part in fulfilling these dreams. Repeatedly had they made obeisance to Joseph according to his dream, and now they stood before him condemned and amazed. As Joseph saw the confusion of his brethren, he said to them, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. He nobly sought to make this occasion as easy for his brethren as possible. He had no desire to increase their embarrassment by censuring them. He felt that they had suffered enough for their cruelty to him, and he endeavored to comfort them. He said to them, Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath a famine been in the land, and yet there are five years, in the which there shall be neither earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God, and he hath made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Haste ye, and go up to my father, and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me lord of all Egypt, come down unto me, tarry not. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children, and thy children's children, and thy flocks, and thy herds, and all that thou hast. And there will I nourish thee, for yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household, and all that thou hast, come to poverty. And behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that it is my mouth that speaketh unto you. And ye shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt, and of all that ye have seen. And ye shall haste, and bring down my father hither. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck, and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brethren, and wept upon them. And after that his brethren talked with him. They humbly confessed their wrongs, which they had committed against Joseph, and entreated his forgiveness, and were greatly rejoiced to find that he was alive. For they had suffered remorse and great distress of mind since their cruelty toward him. And now as they knew that they were not guilty of his blood, their troubled minds were relieved. Joseph gladly forgave his brethren, and sent them away abundantly provided with provisions and carriages and everything necessary for the removal of their father's family and their own to Egypt. Joseph gave his brother Benjamin more valuable presents than to his other brethren. As he sent them away, he charged them, See that ye fall not out by the way. He was afraid that they might enter into a dispute and charge upon one another the cause of their guilt in regard to their cruel treatment of himself. With joy they returned to their father and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. Jacob's sons then made their humiliating confessions to their father of their wicked treatment of Joseph and entreated his forgiveness. Jacob did not suspect his sons were guilty of such cruelty, but he saw that God had overruled it all for good, and he forgave and blessed his erring sons. He commenced his journey with gladness of heart, and when he came to Beersheba, he offered grateful sacrifices and entreated God to bless him and make known to him if he was pleased with their moving unto Egypt. Jacob wanted an evidence from God that he would go with them. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here am I. 
And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again. And Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. The meeting of Joseph and his father was very affecting. Joseph left his chariot and ran to meet his father on foot and embraced him, and they wept over each other. Jacob then expressed his willingness to die, since he had again seen his son Joseph, for whom he had so long mourned as dead. Joseph counseled his brethren, when Pharaoh should ask them of their occupation, to tell him frankly that they were shepherds, although such an occupation was regarded by the Egyptians as degrading. Joseph loved righteousness and feared God. He did not wish his brethren to be exposed to temptation, therefore would not have them in the king's special services amid the corrupting, idolatrous influence at court. If they should tell the king that they were shepherds, he would not seek to employ them in his service and exalt them to some honorable position for Joseph's sake. When the king learned that they were shepherds, he gave Joseph permission to settle his father and his brethren in the best part of the country of Egypt. Joseph selected Goshen as a suitable place provided with good pastures, well watered. Here also they could worship God without being disturbed with the ceremonies attending the idolatrous worship of the Egyptians. The country round about Goshen was inhabited by the Israelites, until with power and mighty signs and wonders God brought his people out of Egypt. Joseph brought Jacob before Pharaoh and introduced his much-honored father to the king. Jacob blessed Pharaoh for his kindness to his son Joseph. And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How old art thou? And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are an hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. Jacob told the king that his years had been few and evil, that is, he had seen much trouble and suffered much perplexity, which had cut short his years. The life of Jacob had not been smooth and peaceful. The jealousy of his wives had brought a train of evils. Some of his children had grieved him and made his life very bitter. But the last years of Jacob's life were more peaceful. His sons had reformed. As Jacob was about to die, his children gathered about him to receive his blessing and to listen to his last words of advice to them. He forgave his children for all their unfilial conduct and for their wicked treatment of Joseph, which had caused him many years of grief, as he had reflected upon his supposed dreadful death. As he spoke with his children for the last time, the Spirit of the Lord rested upon him, and he uttered prophecies concerning them which reached far in the future. While under the spirit of inspiration, he laid open before them their past lives and their future history, revealing the purposes of God in regard to them. He showed them that God would by no means sanction cruelty or wickedness. He commenced with the eldest. Although Reuben had no hand in selling Joseph, yet previous to that transaction he had grievously sinned. His course was corrupt, for he had transgressed the law of God. Jacob uttered his prophecy in regard to him. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power, unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. He then prophesied in regard to Simeon and Levi, who practiced deception to the Shechemites, and then, in a most cruel, revengeful manner, destroyed them. They were also the ones who were the most guilty in the case of Joseph. Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O my soul, come not thou into their secret. Under their assembly, mine honor, be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob, and scatter them in Israel. Jacob thus uttered the words of inspiration to his sorrowing sons, presenting before them the light in which God viewed their deeds of violence, and that he would visit them for their sins. His prophetic words in regard to his other sons were not as gloomy. In regard to Judah, Jacob's words of inspiration were more joyful. His prophetic eye looked hundreds of years in the future to the birth of Christ, and he said, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. 
Jacob predicted a cheerful future for most of his sons. Especially for Joseph, he uttered words of eloquence of a happy character. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him, but his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd the stone of Israel. The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors, under the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph, and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. Jacob was an affectionate father. The words he uttered to his children were not his, spoken because he had retained an unforgiving spirit on account of their wrongs. He had forgiven them. He had loved them to the last. He mourned deeply at the loss of Joseph, and when Simeon was retained in Egypt, he manifested grief and expressed his anxious wish that his children should return safely from Egypt with their brother Simeon. He had no resentful feeling toward his sorrowing children. But God, by the spirit of prophecy, elevated the mind of Jacob above his natural feelings. In his last hours, angels were all around him, and the power of the grace of God shone upon him. His paternal feelings would have led him to utter, in his dying testimony, only expressions of love and tenderness. But under the influence of inspiration, he uttered truth, although painful. After the death of Jacob, Joseph's brethren were filled with gloom and distress. They thought that Joseph had concealed his resentment out of respect for their father, and now that he was dead, he would be revenged for the ill treatment he had suffered at their hands. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us, and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. For they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, Forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them, and spake kindly unto them. Joseph could not bear the thought that his brethren should think that he harbored a spirit of revenge toward them, whom he cordially loved. Joseph illustrates Christ. Jesus came to his own, but his own received him not. He was rejected and despised because his acts were righteous, and his consistent self-denying life was a continual rebuke upon those who professed piety, but whose lives were corrupt. Joseph's integrity and virtue were fiercely assailed, and she who would lead him astray could not prevail. Therefore her hatred was strong against the virtue and integrity which she could not corrupt, and she testified falsely against him. The innocent suffered because of his righteousness. He was cast into prison because of his virtue. Joseph was sold to his enemies by his own brethren for a small sum of money. The Son of God was sold to his bitterest enemies by one of his own disciples. Jesus was meek and holy. His was a life of unexampled self-denial, goodness, and holiness. He was not guilty of any wrong, yet false witnesses were hired to testify against him. He was hated because he had been a faithful reprover of sin and corruption. Joseph's brethren stripped him of his coat of many colors. The executioners of Jesus cast lots for his seamless coat. Joseph's brethren proposed to kill him, but were finally content to sell him as a slave to prevent his becoming greater than themselves. They thought they had placed him where they would be no more troubled with his dreams and where there would not be a possibility of their fulfillment. But the very course which they pursued, God overruled to bring about that which they designed never should take place, that he should have dominion over them. The chief priests and elders were jealous of Christ, that he would draw the attention of the people away from themselves to him. They knew that he was doing greater works than they ever had done or ever could perform. And they knew that if he was suffered to continue his teachings, he would become higher in authority than they, 
and might become king of the Jews. They agreed together to prevent this by privately taking him and hiring witnesses to testify falsely against him that they might condemn him and put him to death. They would not accept him as their king, but cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! The Jews thought that by taking the life of Christ they could prevent his becoming king, but by murdering the Son of God they were bringing about the very thing they sought to prevent. Joseph, by being sold by his brethren into Egypt, became a savior to his father's family. Yet this fact did not lessen the guilt of his brethren. The crucifixion of Christ by his enemies made him the redeemer of mankind, the savior of the fallen race, the ruler over the whole world. The crime of his enemies was just as heinous as though God's providential hand had not controlled events for his own glory and the good of man. Joseph walked with God. He would not be persuaded to deviate from the path of righteousness and transgress God's law by any inducements or threats. And when he was imprisoned and suffered because of his innocence, he meekly bore it without murmuring. His self-control and patience in adversity and his unwavering fidelity are left on record for the benefit of all who should afterward live on the earth. When Joseph's brethren acknowledged their sin before him, he freely forgave them and showed by his acts of benevolence and love that he harbored no resentful feelings for their former cruel conduct toward him. The life of Jesus, the Savior of the world, was a pattern of benevolence, goodness, and holiness. Yet he was despised and insulted, mocked and derided, for no other reason than because of his righteous life, which was a constant rebuke to sin. His enemies would not be satisfied until he was given into their hands, that they might put him to a shameful death. He died for the guilty race, and while suffering the most cruel torture, meekly forgave his murderers. He rose from the dead, ascended up to his father, and received all power and authority, and returned to the earth again to impart it to his disciples. He gave gifts unto men, and all who have ever come to him repentant, confessing their sins, he has received into his favor and freely pardoned them. And if they remain true to him, he will exalt them to his throne and make them his heirs to the inheritance which he has purchased with his own blood. The children of Israel were not slaves. They had never sold their cattle, their lands, and themselves to Pharaoh for food, as many of the Egyptians had done. They had been granted a portion of land wherein to dwell, with their flocks and cattle, on account of the service Joseph had been to the kingdom. Pharaoh appreciated his wisdom in the management of all things connected with the kingdom, especially in the preparations for the long years of famine which came upon the land of Egypt. He felt that the whole kingdom was indebted for their prosperity to the wise management of Joseph, and as a token of his gratitude, he said to Joseph, The land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land make thy father and brethren to dwell. In the land of Goshen let them dwell. And if thou knowest any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. And Joseph placed his father and his brethren, and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph nourished his father and his brethren and all his father's household with bread according to their families. No tax was required of Joseph's father and brethren by the king of Egypt, and Joseph was allowed the privilege of supplying them liberally with food. The king said to his rulers, are we not indebted to the God of Joseph and to him for this liberal supply of food? Was it not because of his wisdom that we laid in so abundantly? While other lands are perishing, we have enough. His management has greatly enriched the kingdom. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceeding mighty. And the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass that, when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. This new king of Egypt learned that the children of Israel were of great service to the kingdom. Many of them were able and understanding workmen, and he was not willing to lose their labor. 
This new king ranked the children of Israel with that class of slaves who had sold their flocks, their herds, their lands, and themselves to the kingdom. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pethom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar and in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. They compelled their women to work in the fields as though they were slaves. Yet their numbers did not decrease. As the king and his rulers saw that they continually increased, they consulted together to compel them to accomplish a certain amount every day. They thought to subdue them with hard labor, and were angry because they could not decrease their numbers and crush out their independent spirit. And because they failed to accomplish their purpose, they hardened their hearts to go still further. The king commanded that the male children should be killed as soon as they were born. Satan was the mover in these matters. He knew that a deliverer was to be raised up among the Hebrews to rescue them from oppression. He thought that if he could move the king to destroy the male children, the purpose of God would be defeated. The women feared God, and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. The women dared not murder the Hebrew children, and because they obeyed not the command of the king, the Lord prospered them. As the king of Egypt was informed that his command had not been obeyed, he was very angry. He then made his command more urgent and extensive. He charged all his people to keep a strict watch, saying, Every son that is born he shall cast into the river, and every daughter he shall save alive.